Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and today I've got a packed episode for you, and I'm excited to get to it, so let's do it. Wow, that was lame. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it in, though. Why not? Let's get started with our In the News segment. Big news story of the past seven days. Okay, first and foremost, big news. Today is April 11th, the day that I'm recording this, and it is Ethel Kennedy's 94th birthday. So a big happy birthday to Miss Ethel Kennedy, an incredible legend and an incredible woman. And I'm sending all the happy birthday well wishes for a great year for Miss Kennedy today. Next up, I wanted to mention an article that was written by Neil Thompson for the Washington Post. I was able to talk to Neil about his book recently. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, you should go listen to it. But he wrote a piece for the Washington Post called an Anti-Irish mobs terrorized JFK's great-grandparents in 1950s Boston. So go check it out. Another interesting little news story this week is that the home that belonged to JFK's grandparents hit the market in Dorchester. This is uh, from realestate.boston.com. So it says a piece of Kennedy family history is on the market in Dorchester for just a little tiny sum of money, $1,299,000. So... I was obviously being incredibly sarcastic, by the way. That is a lot of money. But it says it's tucked on a cul-de-sac with the original street lamps on Carruth's Hill. Three Rundell Park was once the home to a Boston mayor and grandfather of President John F. Kennedy, John Honeyfitz Fitzgerald, and his wife, Mary Josephine Hannon Fitzgerald. It says that Honeyfitz lived in the home until his death in 1945, where his wife remained until the mid-60s, according to historic documents. And it says, but it was the visits from President Kennedy in 1962 that brought tremendous attention to the property. So, if you want to own a piece of history, you just got to give 1.3 mil. Next up, let's get to our inspiring clip of the week. One of the inspiring notes. This week, because it is Ethel's birthday and I want to honor her, I'm going to play a clip from when President Obama gave her the Medal of Freedom. If you haven't watched this, by the way, you should go watch a clip of it on YouTube. But I also wanted to say, I'm going to do an episode about this, but the Medal of Freedom was actually established in 1963 by JFK. And it superseded the original Medal of Freedom that was established by President Truman in 1945. And that was created to honor civilian service during World War II. So I thought it was kind of cool, kind of full circle that President Kennedy's the one that really made it a thing after President Truman. And then Ethel got one from President Obama. So many full circle Kennedy moments. Here's the clip. And finally, we give thanks to a person whose love for her family is matched by her devotion to her nation. To most Americans, Ethel Kennedy is known as a wife, mother, and grandma. And in many ways, it's through these roles that she's made her mark on history. As Bobby Kennedy's partner in life, she shared his commitment to justice. After his death, she continued their work through the center she created in his name, celebrating activists and journalists and educating people around the world about threats to human liberty. On urgent human rights issues of our time, from juvenile justice to environmental destruction, Ethel has been a force for change in her quiet, flashy, uh, unflashy, unstoppable way. Um, As... Her family will tell you, and they basically occupy this half of the room. (laughs) You don't mess with Ethel. She's gone to extraordinary lengths to build support for the causes close to her heart, including helping to raise money for ALS research this summer by pouring a bucket of ice water over her head. (laughs) As you may know, she nominated me to do it as as well, and as you may know, I chose to write a check instead. (laughs) I grew up in Hawaii. I don't like pouring ice water (laughs) on top of my head. That is probably the only time I've ever said no to Ethel, by the way. Uh, Ethel is the matriarch of a patriotic family, and with her encouragement, many of her children and grandchildren are carrying on the Kennedy tradition of public service. She's an emblem of enduring faith and enduring hope, even in the face of unimaginable loss and unimaginable grief. And she has touched the lives of countless people around the world with her generosity and her grace. It gives me great pleasure to present this award, which her brother-in-law, President Kennedy, reestablished more than 50 years ago. 
And next up, I've got my recommendation segment. Of course, then we would uh, recommend it. Because this week's episode is about the Schlossberg siblings, I thought I would recommend a piece of work from them. Tatiana, the middle sibling, wrote a book a few years ago called Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have. I'm going to put a direct link to buy that in the show notes of this episode, and I hope you'll buy a copy. All right, let's get to it. So I have received a ton of requests recently to cover kind of the modern day Kennedys. And I do find myself obviously highlighting a lot of things that the Kennedys have done in history and not necessarily gravitating towards covering the grandchildren now, but I should do that more. So I'm going to. And I came across an article written by Carly Stern for the Daily Mail. It was just published in like February of this year. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I fact checked it a little bit with some Wikipedia dates and stuff, but this Daily Mail article will be the number one source that I use, and I will obviously be quoting it a lot because I can't rewrite the facts of <laughs> of their lives. So, um, like I said, relying heavily on this article, but I thought it really looked into the lives of Rose, Tatiana, and Jack Schlossberg, which are the grandchildren of JFK and Jackie, really well. Obviously, as we know, Caroline is the only surviving child of Jack and Jackie. And also, JFK Jr. never had children before he tragically passed away. So Caroline's kids are the only grandchildren of uh, Jack and Jackie. And they're all really interesting, too. I, I follow Jack Schlossberg on Instagram, and I have for years. I think he's really funny and uh, really smart, too. And he's around my age, so I've always followed him. But they're really cool people. <laughs> so uh, it was really fun to learn about them. And I hope you enjoy this episode diving into their lives a little bit. First, I want to start out by giving some quotes that Caroline had said about her children in 2011 to Parade. Caroline, according to this article, finds it really important that her kids throw themselves into work, even though they are trust fund kids. She wants them to have real lives out in the world and, you know, help others and work for themselves and be self-sufficient. But she was quoted saying, I hope that they'll find people that they love and work that they find compelling and that they're able to make the world around them better for everyone living in it. She also noted the similarities between the children and their grandparents, saying that they look a bit like them. Of course, they're not children now, but her children. So let's start with Rose, which, by the way, if you have not seen Rose, go look up a picture of her. The girl is Jackie reincarnated, I swear. It's uncanny how much she looks like her, in my opinion. But Rose now is 33 years old, and she was born in New York on June 25th, 1988. And she's obviously named after Rose Kennedy, who would be her great-grandmother. Now, according to this Daily Mail article, Jackie was smitten with Rose, and she was called Grand Jackie by the children, which I think is just so cute. Rose was pretty close to Jackie before her death in 1994 when she was five, and I thought it was sweet that Jackie got to meet all of her grandchildren as well. But she grew up close to Jackie until she passed away, and they were like a few blocks away, and she saw her all the time and they were close. And of course, Caroline was close to Jackie too, from what I've seen. So uh, they spent a lot of time together. So when she got a little bit older, she went to Brearley School in the Upper East Side, super expensive, and her mother went there as well, so I would assume that's why she attended. After she went there, she got an English degree from Harvard in 2010, and it says here that during her time at the Ivy League school, she was reportedly involved in Harvard's Project East fashion show, which spotlights Asian designers. You guys know I love Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and his tapes with Jackie, and before his death in 2007, he was quoted saying, Rose was and is the leader of the pack. Her opinion counts. She's highly regarded within the ever-expanding Kennedy circle, and in many respects, she is the face and future of the Klan. Now, this was said when she was still a teenager, and Rose is pretty private. She is not really out there on social media much, from what I can see. She's not really out in the public doing much. She'll speak. She'll, uh, she'll show up at events every once in a while. She was in the video for uh, JFK's 100th birthday commemoration, which I'll actually play a little snippet of that now so you can hear her voice. I'm inspired by my grandfather's sense of equality, his courage in naming the injustices in American society, and his call for action. His words and his ideals mean so much to me and to the world we live in today. But we are still faced with tremendous inequality and injustice, from voting rights to our criminal justice system and mass incarceration. My grandfather would be proud of how far we've come as a nation since 1963, but he'd have been the first to tell us that we have a long way to go. 
I hope everyone, regardless of age or party, will remember what President Kennedy told America decades ago. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. Okay, so now you've heard her, but she she's always just been low profile. She was also rumored to be dating the Incubus guitarist Mike Isinger. I don't know if I said that right. He's a fellow Harvard student, and so while she was there, apparently she was maybe dating him. After she went to Harvard, she got her master's degree in interactive telecommunications from New York University. And then in 2014, uh, President Obama appointed her to the board at the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. She was quoted saying about the center, My grandparents believed that American civilization had come of age and they transformed the White House into a stage for our nation's greatest performing artists. They recognized that in order to demonstrate our full commitment to freedom, democracy, and the human spirit, our nation's capital needed a world-class performing arts center. After my grandfather's death, my grandmother and my great aunts and uncles worked tirelessly to build and sustain the center, and my generation is proud to continue their commitment to excellence. She has created, I have not watched the series, by the way, but in 2016, she created a YouTube series called End Times Girls Club, and she's quoted saying about it, I thought it would be interesting to create this world where girls have to be survivalist without compromising their cute factor. She said it came up as a response to seeing the way that New York responded to Hurricane Sandy and how people were grossly underprepared, specifically girls in damsel in distress mode. So there's a whole series on YouTube that she created and is in if you're interested in watching it. And also in 2017, she co-wrote and produced Time, the Khalif Browder story for Spike TV. She's also worked as a production assistant on 2015's Brick City, a production associate on 2011's Triangle Remembering the Fire, and a production associate on 2012's Hard Times Lost on Long Island. But like I said, very low profile, doesn't do interviews She kind of does her own thing. So that is Rose. Let's move on to Tatiana. She is the middle child, and she was born in New York on May 5th, 1990. She went on to go to Brearley as well, but then she actually transferred and graduated from the Trinity School in 2008. She broke the Harvard streak a little bit and went to Yale instead, and she wrote for the Yale Herald and received the Charles A. Rise Camp Travel Grant Award for her research project, which explored the communities that grew out of the relationship between runaway slaves and coastal New England Native American tribes, particularly on Martha's Vineyard in the 19th century. She graduated in 2012, and then she also received a master's in American history from University of Oxford in 2014. All that was quoted from the Daily Mail article, by the way. So she really went down the journalism route, and she had an internship at the Vineyard Gazette. And then she became a municipal reporter at the Bergen Record. She then went into another internship at the New York Times, but then she started a reporter position, and she has written for Metro as well as Science and Climate. It says that over the years, she's written for The Atlantic, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Vanity Fair, Boston Globe. And then she published the book that I said in my recommendation segment in 2019, which actually won an award, the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award. She's very passionate about climate change and environmental dangers of fast fashion. So I'm going to insert a clip of her talking about that here. One of the things that I I think about a lot is... um, you know, when we think about, for fast fashion, for example, um, you know, the clothes are cheap uh, because no one actually pays for the cost of producing them. Um, and, um, you know, it's cheaper to produce something in China and ship it here because no one pays for things like ocean acidification or sulfur dioxide pollution or, you know, black carbon and the effect that has on the polar ice caps. Um, you know, in addition to the um, healthcare costs for the workers who produce the clothing um, and what happens when they get into landfills in this country and produce methane emissions or, uh, you know, uh, pl- leach plastic um, plasticizers into, into the environment. And so one thing that I, I think about there is that, um, you know, there, there has to be a better system in terms of managing externalities for how we price those things or how companies are held accountable to um, including those effects in their models of profit, I guess. Um, Because somebody actually does pay for the cost, like we pay for the cost in terms of the ecosystem health or the health to the oceans or the healthcare costs to people. Um, And and we also pay for the goods and allow the the companies to profit. And so that's kind of a a really important way that I I think about equity and then, you know, 
the kind of next question from that is, well, what about people who need those clothes or you know can't afford better made clothes? Um, and I think that um, you know that's a really important question and one that kind of gets to the heart of this this equity question. But I also think if you have regulations in place that manage those externalities, um, if you have then all of the products will be more sustainable. Um, and so it kind of eliminates the responsibility on the consumer to make the sustainable choice. She also is married. She met somebody at Yale named George Moran. I may be mispronouncing that. I'm sorry if I did. But he's a doctor and they got married in 2017 in Martha's Vineyard. And last but certainly not least, we're going to move on to Jack Schlossberg. He was born in New York in 1993 on January 19th, and he went to the collegiate school on Manhattan's Upper West Side. And he also went on to Yale at first and majored in history with a concentration in Japanese history. The article says that while he was at Yale, he wrote for the Yale Daily News and the Yale Herald and spent a summer removing toxic waste in Massachusetts before graduating in 2015. So he took a little gap between going to grad school, and he spent time working for the U.S. Department of State. It says he also worked for a Japanese brewing, distilling, and beverage company called Suntory Holdings Limited and a Japanese internet and e-commerce company called Rakuten Inc. He does all kinds of interesting things because he also had a one-episode role in the season 8 finale of Blue Bloods in 2018. That was when he was 25. Speaking of you, young man, you graduated from Yale. You're at Harvard Law School now. You're also pursuing an MBA, so I do hope you land on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we always we always bother you about your future aspirations, but what do you think? Do you, do you feel like you know what you want to do? Are you going to be a lawyer? Are you going to be a businessman? I don't know. Um, I'm, that's why I'm in school. <laughs> your mom asked me to answer <laughs> yeah. these questions. She's like, she's like, come on. Yeah, what are you going to do? Pick a major. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, I don't know what uh, what the future holds. Um, I'm, I've learned a, I'm a lot smarter than when I got to Harvard Law School, so that's a plus, and I'm sure that'll be true when I'm done. Um, but what I do know is that uh, as a young person in this country, it, it's an exciting moment to, uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, a lot of work to do, and I'm excited to be part of solving problems, and I don't know how that'll play out, but... If some were watching TV last weekend, watching Blue Bloods maybe, they may have, may have spotted you somewhere in there. Is, is, uh, is acting anything, is there, is there anything about acting in your future that you see? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about... Uh... <laughs> there you are, Officer Jack Hammer. I mean, come, come on. on. I know, I have to stop making people call me Officer. <laughs> Um, no, I, I don't think I'm going to pursue an acting career. That was really fun for me. It's my favorite show, the dream come true, to be able to do that. So it was a lot of fun. He also works really heavily with the library and Provost and Courage Awards. He was a Senate page and an intern, and he also worked for former Secretary of State John Kerry. John Kerry was once quoted saying, A sense of humor is not genetic, but apparently in the Kennedy family, it can be inherited. In President Kennedy's grandson, Jack Schlossberg, this quality seems to abide. And as I said earlier, he is very funny, in my opinion. So I'm going to play a clip right now of him introducing Jeff Bezos. And I think it's really funny the way that he did it. Here it is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Kennedy Library. I am not a physicist or an astronaut. I do not understand relativity or gravity. So naturally, they asked me to open this panel. <laughs> but if there is one thing that I do know about, it's that speech that we just heard at Rice University. That is, if, in case you were wondering, the greatest speech of all time. It's uplifting. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, because it's hard. It's funny. Why does Rice play Texas? It's motivating. Why climb the highest mountain? Because it's there. I memorized that speech in middle school. I used to make myself watch it every single night before bed, but that paid off when I completely ripped it off in my own high school graduation speech. <laughs> it offers an attitude that I aspire to. At the time, America only had 15 minutes of manned spaceflight. We didn't have the technology or even the materials needed to complete the mission. It was anything but a safe bet. But, but President Kennedy had no interest in sitting around and waiting, and neither did the Apollo generation. It reminds us that a challenge that may seem scary, daunting, insurmountable, impossible, can just as readily be seen as an opportunity for progress, that it's worth pursuing simply because it's hard, that success is measured not only by accomplishing the stated goal, but by all the unanticipated benefits 
that come from rising to the occasion. In fact, landing a man on the moon is just the beginning of what the space program delivered. It advanced miniaturized computing, satellite navigation technology, and much of the technology that would later become the internet. But perhaps most profoundly, it inspired a generation and so many people here today to dream big and be bold and dedicate their lives to science, engineering, progress, and exploration. So when I hear that speech, I feel a responsibility to welcome the challenges of our time. I think about climate change, not as an existential threat, but as the greatest opportunity imaginable, a chance to add our chapter to the story of progress, as I imagine President Kennedy would. But before we solve climate change here today at the JFK Library, we've got a panel discussion between two extraordinary people. One of them has always been there for me, sends me food when I'm hungry, gets me everything I need, reads to me at night and seems to know me better than I know myself, and the other is my mother. So he's also written quite a bit, too, for The Washington Post, The New York Times, Time, and New York Magazine's The Cut. And then he made his way to Harvard in 2017 for a joint GD MBA program, which is nuts. I can't imagine how hard that would be. He told Boston.com, I don't have a life, but that's what I signed up for. It's cool. You just get to learn all day. Sometimes it's tough, but it's been a fun experience. Harvard Law School's great. I'm lucky to be here. It's a really difficult, intense experience, but I know so much more than I did the day before I got to law school. So that's a cool feeling. This article says that he also admitted at the time that his favorite restaurant happened to be on JFK Street, which he said was humbling. He said, there's no pretending that it's not here when I'm at Harvard. The first few days it felt a little weird, but now I don't think about it much. Okay, so at that time, Jack said that he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do in the future. He was quoted saying, I'm kind of hedging my bets. He said, I'm not sure what I want to do, business, law, or something else. He said, I came into law school thinking I really wanted to practice environmental law, and so far my favorite class is in property, which is something I never would have expected. Come three years from now, my interests could be completely different. I'll always be interested in climate issues, but my idea of what I want to do will probably change. And then he ended up telling the Today Show a while later, he said, I'm inspired by my family's legacy of public service. It's something that I'm very proud of, but I'm still trying to make my own way and figure things out. He ended up graduating after that intense college journey. So congratulations to him on that. And he's also been pretty outspoken about politics. He wrote an opinion piece for Politico about Senator Ted Cruz. Apparently, Ted Cruz had talked about his grandfather, and he wrote a piece titled Ted Cruz is No Jack Kennedy. And he wrote in the article, as Kennedy's grandson and as a student of his life, legacy, and administration, I find this notion and the suggestion that Ted Cruz is somehow taking up his mantle absurd. Were my grandfather alive today, he'd be excited about how far we have come as a nation since 1963. He would feel a sense of urgency about the challenges that lie ahead, and he most certainly would not be a Republican. Again, that's what Jack wrote for Politico. He spoke at the 2020 Democratic National Convention, which is pretty cool. And I want to end this by saying, again, I quoted very heavily from this uh, Daily Mail article. I just want to give credit where it's due. This was put together by Carly Stern for Daily Mail in February of 2022. So I'm glad she wrote this because I learned a lot and I hope you guys did from it as well. So that's all I've got today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. I'm going to ask again because I really just need your help. Please rate this podcast five stars and write a positive written review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. You can also rate it if you're on Spotify, which is great. So please do that for me. It helps me out so much and I just would really, really appreciate it. Check out the merch shop per usual. I've got some cool designs. It's getting to be spring, summer, warm weather. Got all the t-shirts, all the fun things. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at Kennedy Dynasty. I'm always posting kind of cool photos there and uh, engaging with the audience a lot. So make sure you're following along and also on Facebook. I'll talk to you next week. Come on and vote for Kennedy. Vote for Kennedy. Keep America strong. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up. Kennedy. Keep rolling up.